So, welcome to another response video. The thing I said I would never do again. Oops. Uh, but I saw some people link the Alt History Hub video in a serious political discussion and decided I kind of needed to make a response to it. I do recognize that all the history topics on the whole are more for entertainment. I also recognize, given the point of divergence is pre-1917 in this scenario, really any change could be justified. My hope is my video response could educate and let people understand why I think this video is entertainment and not even really infotainment. So for this video, we'll be mostly talking about the start of the video, as the latter part is mostly pure speculation, especially once he gets into the World War II scenario, and that's just kind of what alt history is. And some parts of the video are feelings and morality based, so I don't really care to go over those. I'm a communist, and Alt History Hub I assume is a liberal of some flavor, so of course I support a workers' revolution, and he really wouldn't. Uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on that at all, and rather on the historical facts. Before getting the facts of the video, I kind of want to first respond to the people linking this in a more serious political environment. I've had it sent to me as if it was politically relevant, and I really dislike Trotsky's a leader of the USR as an alt history scenario, especially because I think people confuse it as somehow being an important question for Trotskyism. The person who linked it to me thought it debunked Trotskyism as an ideology, that if Stalin replaced with Trotsky, wouldn't have done better than Trotskyism debunked. But that's not really the underpinning of Trotskyism as an ideological movement. And even when Trotsky was alive, people kind of brought this up as a scenario and he dismissed it. Even now, in spite of the dramatic events in the recent period, the average Philistine prefers to believe that the struggle between Bolshevism and Stalinism concerns a clash of personal ambitions or, at best, a conflict between two shades of Bolshevism. The crudest expression of this opinion is given by Normus Thomas, the leader of the American Socialist Party. There is little reason to believe, he writes, that if Trotsky had won instead of Stalin, there would have been an end to intrigue plots in the reign of fear in Russia. And this man considers himself a Marxist. One would have the same right to say there is little reason to believe that if instead of Pius XI, the Holy See were occupied by Norman, the Catholic Church would have been transformed into a bulwark of socialism. Thomas fails to understand that it is not a question of antagonism between Stalin and Trotsky, but of an antagonism between the bureaucracy and the proletariat. Trotsky was also asked why he didn't use his military connections to coup Stalin, and his answer was, There is no doubt it would have been possible to carry out a military coup d'etat against the faction of Zinoviev, Kamenev, and Stalin without any difficulty, and without even the shedding of any blood. But the result of such a coup d'etat would have been to accelerate the rhythm of this very bureaucratization. So Trotsky said just replacing Stalin with him would not have reversed course. He compares this to asking if putting a socialist in charge of the Catholic Church would make it a bulwark of socialism. Trotsky himself pointed out it was structural issues and basically that any Bolshevik in charge could have very well went down the same path if he or others did a military coup. It actually would have gotten worse quicker. So one last thing I really want to hammer in. Due to all the history hubs, point of divergence being as early as it is, it, really any differences with Trotsky's actual positions could probably be justified in that scenario, as I'm sure some fans of his will probably point out. My issue is more we do know what Trotsky called before in the 20s, even if we assume that, say, Trotsky being more of an insider makes him less critical of things, like the ban on factions and how aggressive he would be in enforcing it. I don't think it justifies positions expressed during the Civil War and economic positions after. Hopefully this makes a little bit more sense once I get into it. Also, in order to minimize length, I am keeping the amount that I'm going to show from all History Hub's video to a, a minimum. So, really, you're probably better off watching that video first if you haven't seen it already. And anyway, this introduction is going on far, far too long, and so let's get into it. So before going into such a scenario, we can't simply begin this deviation in some alternate 1924 where, after Lenin dies, Trotsky just takes over instead of Stalin. Some things beforehand need to change. So, to open, I want to talk about a few things I do agree with. The very start of the video talking about how Trotsky really couldn't have taken over in 1924, I think this is very much true. Trotsky was not skilled at all at being a politician. He was also kind of known for being an asshole and not particularly diplomatic. In our timeline, this cost him a few allies at a few points during the 20s. As well, he very much seemed to have considered Stalin stupid, which I don't consider true. He really seemed to underestimate his opponents. Moshe Leuven's Lenin's last struggle, I think, makes the correct assessment in that no, Trotsky was not actually capable of taking power. Trotsky alone would not have been capable of carrying out the reorganization and consolidation and preservation of those later to be purged. Deutscher explains very well why he could not have been Lenin's heir. 
When Lenin finally succumbed to paralysis, for example, he concluded the very kind of rotten compromise that Lenin had warned him against. He succumbed to a fetishization of the party, to a certain legalism, and to scruples that paralyzed him and prevented him from unhesitantly, as Lenin would have done, to what his enemies were doing against him. As the founder, Lenin was not afraid of unmaking and remaking what he had made with his own hands. He was not afraid of organizing the people around him, of plotting, of fighting for the victory of his line, and of keeping the situation under control. Trotsky was not such a man. Lenin disappeared, and Stalin was assured of victory. Now, onto the facts of the video and what I have issue with. Trotsky was a Menshevik until 1917 when he realized they weren't going to win out. So one major change needs to occur for Trotsky to even come close to taking control instead of Stalin. Lenin himself needs to vocally support Trotsky consistently and often. Which, you know, eh, that's quite the thing to imagine. So, while Trotsky did side with the Mensheviks in the split initially, he pretty much fell out with them by the end of 1904 and always existed more floating in the middle ground between Menshevik and Bolshevik. His main error in this time was that he was a liquidationist and that he wanted both groups to merge. When he returned in 1917, he was part of the Inner Borough Organization, which really had no differences in politics that would have excluded them from the Bolsheviks. They also claimed that Trotsky joined the Bolsheviks uh, because they were winning, which really isn't true. A bit of background. In 1917, the Bolsheviks, initially under control of Alexander Shopnikov, opposed the original government. However, the return of Kamenev and Stalin from Siberia in the middle of March changed this when they took over Pravda and began arguing in support of the provisional government and argued against the slogan, Down with the War, as well as they began pushing for unification with the Mensheviks. Overall, it took a more conservative swing. Kamenev even called Lenin's calls for revolution and smashing of the bourgeois state to be anarchist ravings. Because of this, Lenin needed the aid of two figures that he had often been at odds with previously, Nikolai Bukharin and Leon Trotsky. And this is from Cohen's biography of Bukharin. To make a socialist revolution, Lenin first had to radicalize his own party, an uphill struggle that occupied him from April until the final moment in October. He's able to do so in the end by bringing to bear his great persuasive powers, but also by promoting and relying on people previously outside the party's high command. Two groups were crucial in this respect. The Trotskyists, who assumed high positions immediately upon entering the party and played a major role in Petrograd, and the young left Bolsheviks, of whom Bukharin was the most prominent and especially important in Moscow. It would be in May that Trotsky would be invited by Lenin to join the Bolsheviks, but his ego about his own group and becoming a Bolshevik got in the way, at least according to his biographer, and not because of any policy differences. There was also some issues in his group not trusting the Bolsheviks, so he did want to win them over too before joining. At this point too, the Mensheviks looked more like the winning side. They were in the provisional government and were over twice the size of the Bolsheviks at the All-Russian Congress of Soviet and Workers and Soldiers Deputies. So if Trotsky was wanting to just join the winning side, it really would have been the Mensheviks at this point. I don't fundamentally disagree with the part after this. Trotsky was not the skilled politician that Stalin was, and he was not very diplomatic, but I covered this in the intro already. The only evidence we do have of a massive split between Lenin and Stalin was the letter called Lenin's Testament, which called on Stalin to be removed from power. The authenticity of this letter is disputed. First, let's get the authenticity of the Testament out of the way. Kotkin, to my knowledge, is literally the only major historian of this subject to make any claims of it all being less than authentic. Stalin himself never claimed it was either. Kotkin even mentions his position as contrary to the entrenched scholarship. Kotkin as well acknowledges that Lenin's sister, who was not an enemy of Stalin, said it captured something of Lenin's views. The bigger issue I sort of take with this is that there had been no big disagreements between Lenin and Stalin, as well as the idea of Lenin supporting Trotsky vocally would have made a difference. Towards the end of Lenin's life, there was a few large disagreements where Lenin called on Trotsky to defend his positions. I will go over those below. Monopoly on Foreign Trade The Soviet state in 1921 had a monopoly on foreign trade. This meant the state would handle all foreign trading as prevent the internal capitalists in the market from directly interacting with external markets. Figures like Bukharin and Sokolnikov and others opposed this monopoly and wanted internal capitalists to be able to trade directly. They had felt it would just be bypassed by smugglers or the state would not be able to take over these duties. Stalin supported ending it, or at the very least, weakening it. Lenin felt ending this would destroy the national industries and eventually Soviet power. Lenin would successfully prevent the removal of it in May of 1922. However, 
Three days after, Lennon would become partially paralyzed and lose his ability to speak. During this period, moves would be made to remove the monopoly on foreign trade. This would be during October of 1922. Lenin then began the battle to undo this damage. First, he made moves to meet with Stalin and others to make sure it would reappear on the next agenda. Then, on October 11th, he asked Trotsky to meet with him on the problem. Following that, Lenin would send a letter to the Politburo demanding the removal of the decision. They decided to put it up for a vote of the Central Committee. Stalin would also write a note on Lenin's letter. Comrade Lenin's letter has not made me change my mind as to the correctness of the decision of the plenum concerning external trade. Though, Stalin agreed to let the question be brought back up and for Lenin to come and make an argument. However, Lenin knew his health was in decline and he would not be able to defend it. In December, Lenin asked Trotsky that they should join forces and Trotsky agreed. However, Trotsky attempted to bring in a secondary issue at the Goss plan and its powers to regulate trade. Lenin wanted to put the second question off, but he was ready to make concessions to Trotsky's position. At any rate, I earnestly ask you that you take upon yourself at the upcoming plenum the defense of our common opinion. Through December, both men would correspond with great length, as well as other figures who shared Lenin and Trotsky's opinion. December 15th, Lenin wrote a letter to Stalin and other members of the Central Committee that he had taken steps to retire, but he also declared, I have come to an agreement with Trotsky on the defense of my views on the monopoly of foreign trade. In the postscript, he said, Trotsky will uphold my views as well as I. On the 18th, the Central Committee annulled its previous decision. Lenin would send another letter to Trotsky. It seems we have captured the position without firing a shot by mere movements of maneuver. I propose we not stop, but continue the attack. It was actually this that caused an anti-Trotsky alliance to form. Lenin, more vocally supporting Trotsky, actually in some ways maybe might have worsened Trotsky's position as it unified his opponents. Another area where Lenin took issues with Stalin near the end of his life was the Georgian Affair. Following the Red Army invasion of Georgia, there was a movement to establish a Transcaucasian Federation to administer the region. Lenin, while encouraging economic integration, did support taking things slow and with some concession to the Georgian Mensheviks and permitting them in government. The Transcaucasian policy would run into issues with the Georgian Communist Party's Central Committee, who thought it was a bad idea and that things should be taken slower. Stalin's autonomization project was that the republics would be incorporated into the RSFSR as autonomous republics. Lenin would push back on this plan and said that Russia, Ukraine, and others would enter as equals to Russia in the USSR. Georgia, Azerbaijan, and Armenia would enter as equals, but as part of the Transcaucasian Federation. The Georgian Central Committee was pissed and sent letters to Stalin, Kamenev, Bukharin, and Lenin about their opposition, and they were dismissed by each of them. This resulted in a mass resignation by the Georgian Central Committee, and this would catch Lenin's attention. Reports also came to Lenin of physical attacks and drawing of knives by Bolsheviks towards fellow party members in Georgia. The exact reasons we don't know, though the information coming to him from Georgia was probably a part of it, Lenin would go through a very sudden change of mood, and he would declare the need to declare war on the great Russian chauvinism. Lenin would also come out for a weakening of the Union and that the USSR would only be a union for military and diplomatic affairs. The various republics would be given power over their own affairs. I'm going to quote Jeremy Smith summarizing Lenin's notes on the matter. Orzhan Nikidze comes in particular blame for the conflict in Georgia. Dzerzhinsky also distinguished himself by his truly Russian flame of mind in whitewashing Orzhan Nikidze. He and Stalin shared the political responsibility for events in Georgia, and Stalin's haste and his infatuation with pure administration together with his spite against the notorious nationalist socialism played a fatal role here. Dzerzhinsky had been in charge of a commission to investigate this behavior, but... Lenin was convinced he was covering things up. Lenin became convinced there was a conspiracy by the Central Committee to mislead him. Lenin would have his secretaries investigate and repair their own report. In it, they would fully take the side of the Georgians. It was highly critical of Dzerzhinsky and Orzhan Nikitsa. There, however, was no criticism of Stalin in the report, though Lenin assumed he was part of the cover-up in some way. In March of 1923, he wrote to the Georgians Midivani and Makaratze. I am with you in this matter with all my heart. I am outraged at the rudeness of Orzhan Nikitsa and the connivance of Stalin and Dzerzhinsky. I am preparing for you notes in a speech. But Lenin knew he was too sick and would not be able to defend the Georgians, and he turned to the only person he could trust to take up the issue and defend them. He sent Trotsky a letter urging him to take up the defense of the Georgians. 
However, Trotsky would fail Lenin. In part, Trotsky was sick, but he also failed to correctly see the importance of the issue. Stalin and others became aware of what Lenin had said to the Georgians, and he encouraged that a compromise must be reached. Stalin was well aware at the time it would be very bad for him at the time to be fighting with both Lenin and Trotsky. Trotsky, despite turning Lenin down, did end up coming to the defense of the Georgians to an extent, and winning them some concessions and Stalin accepting them. He even pushed to have Orzhan Nikidza removed from his post and deviationist removed from the Georgians, but he only received one vote in support, which was probably Bukharin. All this made Trotsky give up the fight. Eventually, at 12th Congress, Bukharin would make an impassioned speech defending the Georgians, and despite that, neither side really took victory on it, and even had Trotsky decided to fight Stalin about it more, and even with him carrying out Lenin's wishes about it, it probably would not have been enough to dislodge Stalin, who was popular enough at the time, and combined, there was really nothing directly implicating him in the affair beyond helping cover it up. So, to conclude this section... It is possible even more support from Lenin could have made a difference. There was some more than what I showed here, but even if the above didn't matter, how much more difference could anything extra make? I really just want to stress how improbable I think Trotsky taking over would have been. And all History Hub does mention his justification is flimsy, and he is not really sure if it would have made a difference. I kind of wanted to show why I think it really wouldn't. Now onto the portion made by a person with a historian in his channel name. So of course we can assume there is going to be some really good research done on this part. Military. He was the leader of the Red Army and Navy until 1925. So he was in charge of fighting the Russian Civil War and all the various invasions of the time, which were Ukraine, Kazakhstan, the Baltic States, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Armenia, Poland, and Finland. He was a pretty- So while it is true that Trotsky held a lot of influence in the military, it has actually hurt him in many ways not mentioned. This often made him most, the most likely figure to betray the revolution in many people's eyes, a sort of Red Napoleon. And so for this whole bit, I'm actually not quite sure what their point is. They list off a bunch of countries they think Trotsky invaded, but then go to talk about how he was extreme? Are they implying that Trotsky was invading these countries against the wishes of the rest of the state, and so he was seen as extreme? I'm not quite sure, but that's just not how it worked. Trotsky did not invade separate nations without approval from the rest of the government. It is possible maybe they're just listing it off for context that this occurred, but then why include Georgia and Finland? I have an issue with this framing on the whole. When you list countries like this, it gives the impression that these are separate countries. But in the case of the Russian Revolution, many of these places had their own red forces who were on the side of the Soviets, and local nationalist forces, sometimes on the side of the White Army, and sometimes fighting for themselves. So in the context of the Civil War, I don't really think this is like the same thing as invading a fully separate nation with its own government. The reason I say this is because the government seems to be using this as part to justify their alt-history Trotsky being a warmonger, and that he was an extremist within the party. One of the most confusing things they list is Finland. They list Trotsky invaded Finland. I actually can't figure out where they got this idea from. Do they think the Winter War and the Continuation of War occurred during the Russian Civil War? Do they think that all of East Karelia is rightful Finnish land and by not giving it to Finland it counts as an invasion? Finland's independence would be recognized by the Soviet government in 1917, and other than sending some limited aid to the Reds in the Finnish Civil War, there was no invasion, and the aid was cut short due to Germany demanding it stopped. And I could only find two events that really was the nearest point the Red Army and White Finland came into conflict. In May of 1919, the Finns pushed into East Karelia, but the British did not support this move, and they retreated back across the border with the approach of the Red Army. And in June of 1919, according to Red Army intelligence, over 100,000 Finnish troops were building up near Petrograd, and the White Army was trying to get the assistance of Finland. But the Whites wanted to reform the Russian Empire, compared to the fact that the Soviets offered them peace and a guarantee that if they were to stay neutral during the Civil War, they could stay independent. So Mannerheim rejected the Whites and took up the Soviet offer of peace. And so neither of these events could be really considered an invasion of Finland at all. So where they got that idea that Trotsky invaded Finland, I really have no clue. They also list Georgia as a country Trotsky invaded. Rather than the case of the last one, which was wholly an imagined invasion, there actually was an invasion of Menshevik Georgia. However, it's not quite how they paint it. In 1920, the Russian Soviet Republic concluded a treaty with Menshevik Georgia, recognizing its independence. However... 
1921, the Red Army invaded and seized the country. Trotsky, who was in the Urals at the time of the invasion, was enraged, and when he returned to Moscow, he demanded the creation of a commission to investigate the events and to bring to book the presumed adventurer. He would lose the vote, however. So Trotsky really had nothing to do with the invasion of Georgia, and in fact, it happened without his approval, and he was pissed that it happened. Now, the situation with Poland requires a bit of history, I think. In early 1919, Poland made some major pushes east, and due to the precarious situation of the Soviet forces, they made many concessions in terms of land. In late November, the Politburo voted to accept any armistice with Poland, so as long as their campaigns against Petliura and Ukraine. Advances did slow down, because Pilsudski was not that big of a fan of the Whites, and didn't want to hurt the Reds so much that the White Army could pose a threat to Polish independence. There were negotiations of borders, but these would break down in the spring of 1920, and Poland would launch a major offensive on May 6th and take Kiev from the Red Army, though without any fighting because as the Polish army advanced, the Red Army just retreated. In July of 1920, Trotsky stated his intention with all Ukrainian and Belarusian territories secured, he would order the Red Army to halt and not advance any further and make a public offer of peace with Poland. Lenin and the majority of the Politburo were for the continuation of the war into Poland. No one in this debate argued for the idea that communism and revolution could be forced in an unwilling Polish population. Lenin and others knew in 1917 there had been Soviets in Poland and strong support for communism in parts. They believed them to still be there and strong. Even in early 1920, Trotsky spoke about Polish Soviets. None of them were fully aware to what extent they had been suppressed in Poland in the years since. The Politburo asked Polish communists who had joined the Bolsheviks and lived in Russia their opinions. Karl Radek and Felix Drzezinski opposed the invasion and said it would result in a surge of Polish patriotic sentiment. Another Polish communist, Lipinski, greatly exaggerated the strength of Polish communism. Trotsky would side with the opinions of Polish communists who opposed it. Trotsky would submit to the decision of the majority and carry out his job despite opposing it. When the war turned to disaster, Trotsky argued in favor of a peace deal, which Lenin would support him on. So Trotsky opposed the war. However, he was outvoted and he carried out his duty. Again, this part of the video is supposed to be supporting Trotsky's zealotry and why he was considered too radical by the party standards. So how does that fit in with him opposing the war? On to Ukraine. Following the February Revolution, an independent Ukrainian government was set up in Kiev. They would seek recognition from the provisional government, not for full independence, just autonomy and certain rights. The provisional government would reject their demands. Following the October Revolution, there would be negotiations between the Bolsheviks and the Central Rada, and some within the government actually supported some kind of agreement with the Soviet government, like the one they attempted with the provisional government. This would come to an end in December, and open hostilities would begin. The Rada would fail to really gain any support to oppose the Soviet forces. The idea of a Ukrainian nation was mostly exclusive to the towns. Peasant support was only one with the promise of land reform. It also lacked support in the east where the population was more Russian, and among the industrial workers in the cities who were often Russian and Jewish. While there was Soviets established in Ukraine, many either didn't have Bolshevik majorities or opposed the revolution, or didn't have the majority support within their town. In Kharkov, however, the Bolsheviks did have power, and the Soviet there declared a Ukrainian Republic of Soviets. At the time this took place, Trotsky was not in charge of the Red Army, nor was there really any proper Red Army yet. Antonov Ovsienko was in charge, and his chief of staff was Mikhail Moravyov, a left SR, and he took about a thousand men and went to take Kiev. As they moved closer, a revolt would break out in Kiev, and that would be crushed by the Rada, but his forces ended up taking the city. Now, I can't really find much information in any of my books, but this brief period of Soviet Ukraine under the control of Moraviov, I can't find much description of the events that I can fact check beyond Figs mentioning that it was very brutal, her book mentioning the government was horribly Russian chauvinist and oppressed Ukrainians, but it would be a short-lived military-run state due to Ukraine becoming German during the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Eventually, the German-Ukrainian state would end. The Rada re-established itself in Kiev. It would also claim western Ukraine, which caused tensions with the Poles, who also claimed it. Odessa at this time was occupied by the French, and the Bolshevik Pyatkov formed a Ukrainian government in Kursk. A general strike in Kharkov would put the local Soviet back in power. While the Red Army moved south, Chichirin at the time said they were acting on their own to the Directorate of Ukraine, which may not have actually been a lie, at least not fully. Stalin may have given authorization of the invasion without approval, Trotsky, too, wanted to push back into Ukraine. The landing of French troops worried him that even more would land, but Lenin was opposed. 
Now, by early 1919, Ukraine was mostly back in Bolshevik hands. Piatkov was in control this time. Piatkov was one of the clearest examples of great Russian chauvinism. In 1917, he was one of the biggest opponents of self-determination for minorities within the party. Well, being born in Ukraine, he was very much a Russian. He felt separatist tendencies only served the bourgeoisie to stave off revolution. So it is no surprise how he ruled in Ukraine. Collective farms which had failed and were not implemented in Russia were forced on Ukrainians. Ukrainian nationalists were imprisoned in mass. This would result in peasant uprisings and a loss of control of the Ukraine. Lenin would blame Pietkov personally for losing Ukraine to the whites again due to his chauvinism towards Ukrainians. The volunteer army and Petliera would seize back control of Ukraine and Kiev by September after a push north in July. The brutality of these governments would quickly make the brutality of Pietkov be forgotten. Denikin, the leader of the volunteer army, refused to acknowledge Ukrainians even existed. They were just Russians to him. He wanted Russian to be the official language of instruction in Ukraine. Unshockingly, this lost in the support of the Ukrainian nationalists. But the worst crimes of Peltura and Denikin would be what happened to the Jewish population of Ukraine. Estimates of Jews killed in pogroms varies, but it is likely in the hundreds of thousands. If you count those killed, raped, wounded, and orphaned, the number of victims is around a million. This would have been during the Volunteers Army's short period of control of mostly only six months of 1919. While all armies in the Civil War committed pogroms, none did it to this scale. These were systematic. They would move and eliminate entire villages. Officers would declare, so as long as there was Jews in Ukraine, it could not be secured. Their crimes against the Jewish population and their refusal to recognize Ukrainians as existing and deny them any form of autonomy, it is no shock that the population turned on them. This time, when the Red Army pushed back the volunteer army into Ukraine and crushed it, Lenin stepped in in November of 1919, saying they must find a common language with the Ukrainian peasants. He spoke out against the primitive Russian chauvinism displayed by Bolsheviks. He called for the use of Ukrainian language in all Soviet institutions. The Ukrainian left nationalists were admitted into the Ukrainian Bolshevik party. It was through accepting this nationalism and integrating it into the party that peace would come to Ukraine finally. In the period following this, the Ukrainian language would flourish. The Ukrainian population of Kiev would go from 27 to 42 percent. So the first invasion was not done by Trotsky at all because he was not in charge of the Red Army. The second was mostly led by Pietkov, and the third was pushing back the volunteer army and not invading any Ukrainian state in my view. On to the Baltic states. In Estonia and Latvia, both had Soviet governments established at the same time as the one in Petrograd. Remember, the Bolsheviks were not just Russians in European Russia. They existed in all parts of the Russian Empire. In the Baltic, they were particularly strong, though these governments would be short-lived in the Baltic and would either fall to the British or the Germans. In Estonia, a white army push towards Petrograd would be supported. When they were defeated, they retreated into Estonia, and Trotsky did in fact call for an invasion to crush the white army. However, Estonia realizing the situation they were in and the Bolshevik diplomats were able to offer Estonia a peace treaty if they stayed neutral, the White Army in Estonia would be disbanded and the peace treaty signed. Following the collapse of the German-controlled states, both nationalists and local Red forces fought in Latvia. There had been a very strong Red presence there, and with the aid of units of the Red Army, the Latvian SSR was established. In early 1919, though, it collapsed due to economic destruction from the war, and that German connected forces and the Estonian government pushed south and had been cut off from Russia, thus sealing its fate. Lithuania. This is a bit shorter, as not really many of the books I have touch on it that much. Parts of it were controlled by Red forces in early 1919, briefly after Germany pulled back, but then it was lost to the White Army in Poland. In the intervening months, Lithuania actually had a government established and an army, but part of the country would end up in Soviet hands again during the war with Poland. But due to the loss against Poland and any red forces in Lithuania left. Now, I can't find much on the Baltic states and Trotsky specifically, but one note at the bottom of the page in Profit Arm says that Trotsky had urged peace with the Baltic states. So, take that as you will. Armenia. Not a lot to write about here. At the time of the seizure of Armenia, it came after Armenia had already been defeated by Turkey. A local uprising by local Bolsheviks, followed by the Red Army, had the government surrendering without a fight. Trotsky was not involved with this, as he was busy with Poland at the time. This was done under Lenin's orders. So, to be honest, for Kazakhstan, I can't really find anything within Russian Turkestan. The amount of information I could find is actually pretty low. 
And this kind of ties back to my issue of talking about things as if they existed as nations. By the point the Red Army took Kazakhstan, it was really just White Army forces rolled over by Kolchak. And when we talk of Trotsky's invasion, he was at the west at the time. Kamenev was actually overseeing this front, and Trotsky didn't want him to push east at the time, but Trotsky had overwritten and Kamenev pushed east. So again, I'm really questioning how this proves that Trotsky was an extremist, but moving on. Azerbaijan. We finally come to the last country listed. From the time of its independence to April 1928, it had five different governments. The governments were blocked from land reform by the local capitalists, which pissed off the rural poor. Unemployment was also high due to them no longer being able to export oil to Russia, which really made a fertile ground for Bolshevik recruitment amongst the lower classes, as well as the army refused to resist and Baku was taken without any armed resistance. And Trotsky again at this time was busy with Poland and didn't take part in this invasion. So in conclusion, how does any of this show Trotsky's extremism? None of these invasions that did happen were something he was for alone, and even if he was for them, which was not the case in several of these invasions, that would not have been something that made him an outsider of the party, as there was support for these, and Stalin supported them as well. So if that hurt Trotsky, why wouldn't it have also have hurt Stalin? So again, I don't see how all that's supposed to show Trotsky was disliked by being too extreme. These weren't invasions done by Trotsky's alone, and in some cases there were no invasions where Trotsky was opposed to it. However, there was some disagreements with him on war policy, mostly around his use of czarist officials, as well as, in general, his military experience, I think, hurt him because people viewed him as a potential Bonapartist, a military leader who might betray the revolution. So, Trotsky and the Terror. Including trying to justify the Red Terror, which was when the Bolshevik secret police, called the Cheka, suppressed dissent through state terrorism and mass executions, including sending people to work camps, though they weren't called gulags yet. No wonder why he wasn't well-liked, even by the party establishment. Here, they're really not wrong. Trotsky was in fact one of the major defenders of the Red Terror. And not all Bolsheviks supported the Terror, at least in the way that it was implemented. Though, very few were opposed to it on any level. So again, why would this mean no wonder he was not well liked? This was a popular position. How does supporting the Terror make him an extremist that would make him not liked by the very party that implemented the Terror? Like, seriously. How would supporting the Bolshevik terror make him unpopular amongst the Bolsheviks? How does this make sense at all? I also just kind of find their definition of terror to be inaccurate. They define it as, which was when the Bolshevik secret police suppressed dissent through terrorism and mass executions. I, at the very least, wouldn't limit it to the actions of the Cheka. In many cases, the terror started well before the official one, as workers and peasants took revenge on those they thought to be their enemies. And I would consider that part of the terror. I also disagree with the comment about they weren't called gulags yet. What existed during the Civil War was very different from the gulag system. To quote Soviet penal policy 1917 through 1934, a reinterpretation. Civil War camps were located in the heartland of Russia, not in the remote regions of Siberia or in the north. So when their prisoners, as Solzhenitsyn was aware, were allowed to live in residence outside the camps, more important, the food and clothing provided to the camp inmates were reportedly of relatively good quality, consisting in some jurisdictions of one Red Army ration per inmate. Nor can one speak of direct evolution from the Civil War camps to the Stalin camps, because the former were closed in 1922 after the penal systems of Narcommunist and Narcom Venoodle merged. The immediate forebears of the Stalinist camps were the northern camps of the OGPU and Solovki, which were opened in 1921 through 1922. The bulk of the prisons and camps during the Nep era never resembled the Gulag system. This is something I would like to do a future video on, how the rather progressive for at the time system in use during the Nep died and was replaced with the Gulag system. As well as Trotsky's Red Army made use of POW labor, which is just kind of the reality of war. During World War II here in Kansas, we used plenty of German POWs as agricultural laborers. The Geneva Convention, which didn't exist at the time, even permits for POWs as laborers. And I don't think the use of POWs with, as laborers is comparable to the gulags. Now, finally, we are on to the part of the video where Trotsky is in charge. This is a little less history-based and more speculation, so I can't really say for 100% on any given thing here they're wrong, but 
I just want to point out there are things that don't line up with the previous positions of Trotsky. I understand it is halt history, and at the end of the day, you could say Trotsky goes mad and starts to eat children, and well, that is okay because it's all history. But I really just want to talk about where there are things that they have Trotsky do that does not line up with his previous positions during the Civil War or the 20s, as I explained in the intro. From his exile, Trotsky's main criticism of Stalin's government was its brutish egotism. Party officials making decisions on matters they really had no experience in. So, Trotsky's use of experts. And I don't know if I would say this is his main criticism, but yes, Trotsky was someone who was always for consulting experts, and he had a dislike of letting party officials take care of things. This can be seen during the Civil War, with him using czarist officers. Or after, where he wanted experts in control of economic choices, and not necessarily the party, though, with the party overseeing them. So yeah, I think Alt History Hub is actually correct on this. I also kind of want to mention that Trotsky's use of experts didn't mean he was for some detached technocrats running everything. This is from Trotsky in 1925. We must not build socialism by the bureaucratic road. We must not create a socialist society by administrative order. Socialist construction is possible only within the growth of genuine revolutionary democracy. So to get this out of the way, the gulag system still exists as political prisoners are put into camps. But this wasn't really anything new or unique. And then he brings up gulags. I kind of responded to this earlier. To my knowledge, I can't ever find Trotsky commenting much on this. Though, the major changes in Soviet penal policy happened after his exile, so it's hard to know what his position on it might have been had he stayed, or not, well, not been exiled. A big part of this seems to be based on the idea of Trotsky's fanatic, which, again, I don't know where that argument's quite coming from. So, I can't say 100% sure that we would not have ended up something with somewhat similar to the Gulag system, but I don't take it as a guarantee either. So I feel this needed to be focused on at some point. But what of the Holodomor? The Holodomor, for context, was the mass starvation that took place in Ukraine between 1932 and 1933. And one of the main questions when imagining Stalin never coming to power is, would this still happen? Yes. Just not as extreme. Within the peasants, there was an upper class of landowners that hired labor to work their land, known as kulaks. As the kulaks were certainly not happy about the whole collectivizing thing, this discontent led to the Soviets labeling them as enemies of the revolution, and encouraging the lower class of peasants to rise up against them. The Soviets would have cracked down on the kulaks no matter what. Trotsky was actually a main proponent in punishing the kulaks, and from his exile was shocked that Stalin went through with the plan, though he disagreed on the methods, which is really a common theme with Trotsky. The intentions are good, but I never would have done it that way. So this alternate USSR still sees the kulaks punished. What really caused the Holodomor wasn't simply these factors. It was Stalin's export of Ukrainian grain to other parts of Europe, and his crackdown to make sure no news of the famine came out. I don't imagine Trotsky would do the same approach. He was against any trade with capitalist nations, so he wouldn't need to sell off any grain. The main change is that there are resources and food that could be shared, and under Trotsky, they would remain within Ukraine. And on to the Holodomor and the Kulaks. And I have some major issues with this part. Yes, Trotsky was for collectivization, but his plan differed vastly from Stalin's. And I actually did a video on this. I don't think the Holodomor would have occurred under Trotsky. He generally had a better understanding of agriculture given his background of growing up on a farm in Ukraine. The spiral towards the grain strike was Stalin's main motivating factor in him losing confidence in the NEP and switching to forced collectivization. And to quote Richard B. Day, the only policy that might have avoided the grain strike was put forth by Trotsky. Underlying the dangers inherent in the goods famine, Trotsky consistently appealed for accelerated investments in the consumer goods industries. And as I covered in my video, did Stalin steal Trotsky's economic program? Trotsky was not for forced collectivization. He was not for violently ending the kulaks. In 1923, he condemned the idea of de-kulakization proposed by Zinoviev. To use a bit of the quotes I used in my other video, which you really should go watch in full on this subject. 
Trotsky's actual economic proposals in the 1920 were based on the NEP and its continuation. He urged greater attention to heavy industry and planning earlier than did Bukharin, and he worried about the village Kulak, but his remedies were moderate, market orientated, or as the expression went, NEPist. Like Bukharin, he was a reformist in economic policy, looking towards the evolution of NEP Russia, towards industrialization and socialism. In propaganda texts, the majority spokesmen accused the left of planning to liquidate the NEP to oppress the peasantry to raise prices and lower the standard of living and other sins. But the latter, no doubt, sincerely reasserted it that it favored the NEP, did not intend to expropriate the property of the Kulaks, nor indeed that of any other private entrepreneurs, and that it, in fact, even welcomed some growth of these elements, provided the growth of the socialist sector, mainly industrial, was constantly assured. They opposed using the GPU against the private sectors. By the way, the left in that refers to the left opposition, which would have been Trotsky's faction. I say Trotsky was not for trade with capitalist nations. I have no idea where they got this fact from. Trotsky very much was for... Trotsky was for buying foreign consumer goods to help make sure the peasants were happy in areas where local Soviet industry was lacking to give them time to build up those industries. Trotsky even supported grain exports. He wanted to import foreign industry to help with industrialization, which could have only been paid for with grain exports. Trotsky had been against certain plans of trade and wanted to make sure that there was a monopoly on foreign trade, but he was not against foreign loans and trades as he thought it was the only way to break the deadlock between agriculture and industry. So, he agreed with the goals but not the methods. This is probably my single biggest issue with this video, is I kind of talk about it being a minor thing that Trotsky disagreed with the methods, but the methods are a huge thing. If I hate my neighbor and that he lets his dog poop on my lawn, I might want him to stop. My method might be talking to him or putting up a fence. If my roommate decides to murder my neighbor and his dog, sure, we had the same goals, but we disagreed on the methods. I I don't know how someone can act like having a difference in opinion on method is a minor aspect. And as I've shown, they had different goals in mind. And so now on their part on Trotsky in charge in World War II, I, I'm mostly going to skip over this part on what Trotsky in charge of World War II would look like is not an interesting question to me, and I don't have much to add. Though I think they paint Trotsky as a warmonger, and well, I made a video on that. You should go watch it if you want to see my thoughts on that. Uh, I also don't want to get to the whole socialism one country thing. I think it is an incorrect way to examine the differences between Trotsky and Stalinism as internationalism versus nationalism. It's just not true on that being the big key difference. If you like look at their economic differences, Trotsky was for building up the country economically. Isn't that what the nationalist should be doing, not the internationalist? And Stalin, at least initially in the early 20s, seemed to support more slower economic development. That doesn't really make sense through a framework of internationalism versus nationalism, but I could make a whole video on that topic. Anyway, uh, they also claim around 12 minutes into the video that Trotsky didn't make the smartest military choices because he invaded Poland. Trotsky opposed the invasion of Poland, as I showed. I So I don't know how this can show he made a bad choice when he was opposed to the invasion. Uh, I don't know why they claim this, because he opposed it, and that's a pretty well-known thing. Thing that you would pretty quickly find if you did research on this. Anyway, Trotsky's legacy. I'm not going to go into depth on this part. A lot of their assessment here is on faulty grounds. This has been shown. I take issue with the Mackenzie's gift. Trotsky is partially responsible for this what if scenario. As I showed in the opening, he shot that down. Also, no, Trotskyism is not based on the idea of what if Trotsky was in charge. I also deal with the disagree of their idea that Trotsky did some brutal things during the Civil War, therefore he would have done the same things as Stalin. There's a difference between actions in war and peacetime, so I don't think that's a guarantee. And now for what is probably the single wrongest idea expressed in the video, the idea that neoconservatism came out of Trotskyism and that Trotskyism influences both the right and left in the U.S. Trotsky formed the Fourth International after his exile, and it lives on as the standard bearer for what vanguard communism could have been. They're still active and under the guise of Trotsky's supposed promise, often working closely with what came to be known as the New Left. They're so influential that members who opposed the counterculture of the 1960s began their own form of conservatism, now called neocons. So literally both sides of current American politics were heavily influenced by this myth.
Now, I'm actually planning on doing a full video on this, but I wanted to give a short overview here. I'm just going to quote William F. King's Neoconservatives and Trotskyism, which was published in American Communist History in 2004. Yet today, as a result of the civil war within American conservatism, it is precisely the history of the neocon that is being distorted through a polemic campaign aimed at prominent neoconservatives in the foreign policy of the Bush administration. Leading the campaign against the neocons are self-styled paleoconservatives, an intellectual faction made up of libertarians, right-wing populists, and traditionalist conservatives who consider themselves the legitimate successor to pre-Cold War old right. In attempt to discredit the neocons' conservative credentials, the paleocons have forcefully asserted that neoconservatism is the descendant of American Trotskyism, and the neoconservatives continue to be influenced by Leon Trotsky and their views on foreign policy. Reflecting a propensity for flirting dangerously with when not openly embracing anti-Semitism, paleoconservatives have charged the cabal of Jewish neocons manipulating the U.S. foreign policy and implementing Trotsky's theory of permanent revolution from the White House. Very few four of the original neoconservatives were ever Trotskyists. The small minority of neocons that were involved in the movement passed briefly and marginally through it during their late adolescence. So, basically, this is just old slander and anti-Semitic conspiracy. Now, not everyone who believes in this is anti-Semitic or is arguing there is a Jewish cabal controlling modern American conservatives, but some of the people who helped initially popularize the theory of neocons descending from Trotskyism without a doubt did think there was a Jewish cabal. And now in the conclusion... I don't have much to add now in the conclusion. At the end of the day, all history is entertainment. The core issue, and is what promoted me to make this video, is seeing people sharing this in more serious political spaces, or repeating things they heard from it in those spaces. It's a fun enough little video as long as you don't take anything in it said as an historical fact, even the part trying to cover history by the person with historian and their channel name. And with all my videos, you can find the script in the description, which contains my work cited. To end, I want to just repeat the sentiment that Trotsky himself mocked the idea that just replacing Stalin with him would have changed the USR into a bulwark of socialism, compared it to putting a socialist in charge of the Catholic Church. Anyway, hope you found this video informative. Please go watch the other two videos of mine I referenced in this video. Was Leon Trotsky for spreading the revolution via the Red Army? And did Stalin steal Trotsky's economic program?